great. Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, we'll make a start uh, for this afternoon session. My name is James Wilson, uh, and I'm one of the program leaders for, for CG, uh, and the rest of the time based uh, up at Sheffield University. Um, and it's my pleasure to, to chair this session, which is, which is focused on China. Um, as Simon Marginson reminded us in characteristically insightful uh, opening remarks, few of the unfolding stories in global higher education are more uh, exciting and important than that which is uh, now unfolding in different ways uh, across China. I won't rehearse again uh, the statistics that uh, demonstrate that. Simon gave us a few. There are more uh, in the working paper that's been published alongside this event. Um, but we're all aware of quite how important and significant uh, the Chinese higher education and research system has become, uh, of course, primarily for China and its people, but also uh, for the rest uh, of the world. Um, I'm, I'm no great China expert, but I did lead a couple of studies for the UK government um, 10, 15 years ago now on the science and, and research side of the Chinese system, looking ahead uh, at the time when China was putting in place its 2006 medium to long term plan for, for science and innovation. And it was very obvious then uh, that the, the trends, the ambition, um, and some of the delivery mechanisms. Um, but I think even among China optimists, uh, the scale, the pace uh, of what has been achieved in, in a relatively short space of time is, is nothing short of astonishing. To steer us through this fascinating uh, terrain, we're absolutely delighted to be joined by uh, Pr Professor Niang Kai Liu. Uh, Nian is uh, Dean of the Graduate School of Education uh, at Shanghai Jiao Tong University, uh, a leading scholar uh, and commentator on uh, world ranking universities, on the globalization of HE, and on academic rankings. He, of course, developed back in 2003 uh, the academic ranking of world universities, which is very closely watched uh, all over the world, including here in the UK. Uh, Nian is going to talk to us about the performance and role of Chinese HE uh, in the light particularly of some recent um, initiatives and developments uh, across the Chinese system. Uh, we're absolutely delighted he could be here and look forward very much to hearing his remarks. Yeah. Thanks, Chair, for the introduction, and thanks, uh, Professor Simon Madison, for inviting me to be here. It's an honor and a pleasure to uh, be here and uh, talk about the, the performance and the role of Chinese higher education. Uh, uh, give me a, just a very brief overview of Chinese higher education. Of course, you already, most of you already know China is or has already the largest uh, higher education system. Uh, with the number of enrolled students 37 million, and the gross enrollment ratio is 43 percent last year, it's increasing. And the number of new graduates, just the number in this year, 2018, will be more than 8 million, uh, with more than half a million master's uh, graduates and more than 50,000 doctor new doctors, which is. For doctor is more or less the same as uh, U.S., so still not the largest. Uh, the total high education uh, investment is about 160 billion U.S. dollars, uh, which, if you consider the purchasing power, more or less close to that of uh, U.S. and the Europe, European Union. Uh, but the expenditure per student is still very low. Uh, Another part of the system, Chinese higher education system is the uh, internationalization. Uh, you have, a, by the statistics of, of the Ministry of Education, you have a, more than 2,600 international collaboration programs and projects, and uh, they are increasing also rapidly. Uh, the international students uh, studying in China uh, was 490,000 last year. Uh, the year before was 440,000, something like that. Uh, about 10% increase every year in the last few years. Uh, also, another part of the internationalization is the 
uh, Chinese universities are now Ohio being establishing uh, campuses or programs outside China. Uh, more than 100 of that already. Research at Chinese universities, actually around about 30 years ago, there's not much research at all in Chinese universities. At that time, 30 years ago, almost all the Chinese universities are teaching universities or teaching universities. So uh, because we had the uh, former Soviet system of we separate uh, research institution, institutions of Chinese Academy of Sciences. But now, 80% uh, of the scientific publications by Chinese is <coughs> contributed by, by universities. And 80% of the research grants of the National Science, Science Foundation of China is also awarded to university <coughs> researchers. So it's uh, 30 years later, now it's uh, really important player in the Chinese uh, national research system. Uh, there's a number of uh, the chairman and the professor Murchison this morning at the opening also, uh, all mentioned about the total number of publications, uh, international scientific publications uh, from China is now more or less the same as the US. Uh, uh, if you talk about the universities, several universities, I think seven <coughs> universities, Chinese universities last year, uh, were among the top 50 universities in the world in the number of uh, publications in the web of science. So the number is there, but the citation is still very low. Uh, I mean, compared to the uh, developed the world is uh, the citation per paper is still below the world average, not the average of the developed world, the world average. Uh, just one slide on uh, recent development in, in China. The, the, the R&D expenditure of China last year was about 280 billion US dollars. 2.1% uh, of the GDP is more or less the same as European Union. Uh, and the increase at rate also about 10% in the last five years. And uh, we hope, I expect to increase at that rate in the next few years. Uh, another important thing is, I want to mention is the Chinese government just announced the major national initi initiative <laughs> to strengthen uh, fundamental research just uh, a couple of months ago. There's no details yet, but uh, it should come, uh, the details should come by the end of this year. Uh, I'll, I'll see us briefly about the excellency initiatives. There's a lot of excellency initiatives in China, normally named by numbers, 2011. Uh, the latest one is a double world class project. The 211 project uh, is, uh, was uh, about to uh, develop 100 first rate class universities, and the subjects uh, started in the 1990s uh, until 2015. Uh, 2015. Uh, the funding is uh, well, at that time, it's, 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 it's a lot of funding for the Chinese universities, but it's much less than the 985 project. The 985 project, 985 project started from 1999. <laughs> there had been three phases. Uh, there are some transition years in between the three phases. Uh, much more funding, of course, for the universities, but much less the number of universities uh, funded by the project uh, was much less, 39 as compared to more than 100. And uh, the top nine universities, the so-called C9 group, uh, had received close to half of the government funding. So it's very uh, uh, concentrated uh, on the top for university. The latest uh, project, uh, double world class, started from last year. Uh, as uh, the goal of that, uh, 42 universities to build 
to become world class by the mid, mid of the century. And another 95 universities uh, to build one or a few world class subjects or disciplines. Uh, this, the latest project of double world class, uh, is actually an upgraded uh, form of the 95, 211, 2011. All of those projects uh, is not existing anymore. It's uh, all included in this uh, new double world class project. Uh, the institution is uh, in this project 42 plus 95. Uh, they have the autonomy of making their strategic plans, and uh, but they are required to post their plans on their websites. Uh, so you have the autonomy, but you have to be checked. Uh, there will be an evaluation expected 2020. Uh, it's said that uh, those not form performing well enough will be removed from the project. We hope, uh, looking forward to that because during the, for the previous uh, 211, 985, and 2011, and other projects, none actually were removed from projects after evaluation. Uh, the impact of excellency initiatives, I, I think, is uh, mainly, that's my, my, my uh, viewpoint, that it's, uh, uh, in, institutions and the leaders uh, in the government and in the universities, uh, they realize the importance of world-class universities for national innovation system and knowledge-based economy, and also uh, for importance of international competition. Because until 20 years ago, Chinese universities were not doing much research and not competing at all internationally. Uh, just uh, some, a couple of slides for uh, the institutional practices of these top universities involved in these, these projects. First of all, they, they, they set strategic goals uh, by their strategic plans of either five year or three year or uh, by the project of those uh, excellence initiatives. And the universities, these top universities also require their schools and departments to make strategic plans accordingly, uh, during which process these schools and departments have to benchmark themselves with their international peers or uh, references, we sometimes call. Uh, the most important thing, actually, of course, everybody talks about talents, yes, is improving the quality of faculty. Uh, in the past, let's say, 20 years, the top universities are uh, raising the, uh, has been raising the uh, requirements for recruitment and uh, criteria for promotion and uh, annual evaluation. Uh, there's a, because of this, there's a lot of pressure, increasing pressure uh, for the professors. Uh, if you ask the professor, most of them will always complain about this pressure, uh, including myself. Uh, there's special initiatives to recruit faculty members with doctoral degrees uh, of uh, world-class university, and uh, uh, those have work, working experiences at world-class universities, uh, mean tenured at world-class universities. So uh, each university has a different uh, plan, but uh, normally they have uh, this kind of initiatives. Of course, uh, the university's top university encourages uh, research excellency of international standard uh, with a lot of different incentives in terms of funding, facilities, laboratories, human resources, uh, and of course, uh, uh, salaries or bonuses. Uh, I'll just put that. Uh, also, the promoting internationalization. Uh, in the past, the, the, in the past few years, the top Chinese universities, more or less, are actually uh, all 
trying to reduce the number of strategic partners in the world. Uh, like, because, for example, my university, uh, so 10 years ago, we, have, uh, we had uh, about uh, more than 100 uh, strategic partners with the uh, MOU. Oh. But uh, now it's much less. It's uh, maybe less than half of that. Uh, in addition, the university selected only a few uh, real strategic partners uh, of world class or world top universities um, for uh, more collaboration. Uh, financing is always a problem. We never have enough funding. Uh, any university in the world never ha has enough funding. Uh, the same for Chinese universities. Now, um, the, we have uh, the top Chinese universities have a, a more, uh, increasingly more diversified uh, financial resources. Uh, the regular uh, block funding from uh, based on the number of students, of course, but it's only a small uh, percentage, uh, I would say around 10 to 15 percent of the total revenue of a, univer of a top university. The government uh, funding of special initiatives such as the double world class 95, uh, that depends on the universities, but also maybe 20 to 25 percent, uh, <coughs> only the top few universities, 20 to 20, 25 percent of the total revenue. Research income is always uh, the largest part, uh, I would say around one third of the total revenue. A small, uh, maybe 10 percent of from tuition fees and the revenues from continuing education and professional training. Endowments and donations uh, are now increasingly more important, particularly before su uh, supporting the chair of professorship, because you cannot just increase the salary for everybody, but you have to re increase uh, the salary of this chair pro pro professorship to uh, attract those, uh, let's say, tenured already in the world class universities. They got more or less the same uh, <coughs> income as they were in the West. Uh, so the influence of all of, the, of these institutional <coughs> strategies in the last uh, 20 years, let's say, uh, it's really the organizational culture changed from domestic standards to international. Uh, from domestic competition to international one, and from quantity indicators to quality ones. I'm saying still quality indicators, not quality uh, itself. Indicators, we are working on indicators, but it's, uh, it's not quantity uh, indicators anymore. I'll just uh, 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 use this ranking, my ranking, uh, to explain a little bit further about the performance and the role of top Chinese universities. Uh, I'll just pass this. Uh, I'm not sure I should. Uh, maybe we have uh, just a few, uh, six indicators anyway, that was at that time. So it was uh, very simple. And, and the, the weight for each indicator uh, was arbitrary. Uh, but anyway, so the changes in the top 500 universities from 2004 uh, until last year. So China from uh, 8 to 45 <coughs> in the top 500. Also to Australia got uh, quite significant increase. And uh, these are the physicians top five Chinese universities in, in the ranking, Tsinghua, Peking, Zhejiang, Shanghai, Jiao Tong, and Fudan. You can see the increase. Now Tsinghua and uh, Peking uh, is in the top 100. The other three is, uh, universities are close. Last year should be in the uh, top 100 uh, in the next few years. So still increasing. Uh, of course, the improvement is remarkable. The, uh, already, as I said, in the top 100 list. But, but the gap is still huge. Uh, 
the, uh, the original purpose of the ranking was to find up the gap between top Chinese universities and world-class universities. Uh, you see the number of Chinese universities appearing in or close to the top 100 is still small comparing uh, with the total number of universities or total number of uh, uh, students. Uh, uh, this and even these five I just showed are still far away from the top 20, just by the indicators. Uh, if you consider uh, population and the GDP of class of China, the gap is even bigger, right? In both in quality and quantity of the top universities. Uh, the design of the, uh, the ranking uh, indicators there's a lot of complaints, criticism for the uh, indicators. But uh, first of all, uh, <laughs> those all the indicators uh, I could find uh, 20 years ago. Or, yeah, just 20, was started the benchmarking 20 years ago. Um, so uh, that's the reality. But I don't believe these, uh, uh, which is agreed by I would say most of you in the room and uh, in the academic community, these indicators are important for uh, world-class universities or world top universities. Uh, for example, alumni and uh, award uh, of the uh, Nobel Prize and Fields Medals, they are considered as top quality indicators to differentiate or top universities, top 20, let's say. And the top 20 universities in the ranking have about 50% <coughs> share of the alumni and the world of all universities. And in total, only about 140 universities in the world until <coughs> now have ever won a Nobel Prize. Or, uh, yeah, Nobel Prize. So uh, it's, it's not fair, I was always complain it's not fair for the rest of the university because only 140, <laughs> around 140, however, I won a Nobel Prize. But again, if you think another way, the design of the indicator is really the quality. If you don't have a Nobel Prize or first medals, you are not a top uh, university in the world. Anyway, uh, the highly cited researchers and the nature and science uh, papers as a high quality indicator to differentiate world class universities. That's, that was my idea anyway. Uh, the top 100 universities in the ranking have about 60% share of the highly cited and nature, uh, both of the highly cited and nature science papers of all universities, respectively. Uh, and the top 200 universities in the ranking have close to half publications of all the universities ranked which is now about <coughs> 1,300, or a bit more than 1,300. So that's the idea. If you then, uh, from that idea, uh, the design of the indicators, uh, we look at the performance of different groups of universities. For, for example, Harvard University is always number one uh, in the last uh, 15 years. It has uh, 11 uh, award, these, these uh, 38 alumni, 84 highly cited researchers, and 40, uh, 460 nature and science papers, uh, that's in five years period. And 17,000 <coughs> publications uh, in the web of science. Then the average of top 20 universities in the ranking, uh, much less of course you expect that, and the average top 100, only 1.5 award, and the 13 highly cited researchers. Uh, then if you compare with the average of the top five <coughs> Chinese universities in the ranking, I just showed the trend of those top five, there's no award, uh, very s small number, a neglected number of alumni, and six highly cited <coughs> researchers, uh, and 23 uh, papers in the nature and science. Still really far away. Even the total of top five <laughs> Chinese universities in the ranking is not comparable at all with uh, 
Harvard University is one. So if you add the total of top 50 universities, uh, top 50 Chinese universities in the ranking, it's still the highly cited is more or less the same as just Harvard, top 50, which are the best of universities in, in China and uh, produce most of the uh, important uh, research. But still, the total of top 50 is just about the same as Harvard. Uh, the Nature and Science papers published is the total of 50 is just about less than half of Harvard. I mentioned earlier that these universities are among the top 50 in terms of international publications. But if you consider these top quality indicators, so my conclusion is it's a long way to go for these top Chinese universities. Uh, they, are quick, yeah, they are improving quickly, but still it's really a long way to go to be fully competi competitive with world-class universities. I will say a few remarks on uh, um, um, the challenges. The challenges, because many of these things, the challenges, I mean, it's talked all the time uh, in different meetings. The percentage of faculty members, I mean, in, 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 inside the institutions, the institution level, the really the main challenge I think, is the faculty members, they are doing, they are not doing research uh, because of intellectual curiosity. The percentage is very low. If I actually did this kind of, I did uh, kind of, not survey, I interviewed uh, many of the top uh, researchers, the staff professors in my university a few years ago, asking this question. What do you think of the percentage of faculty members are doing research uh, because of intellectual curiosity? Some say it's a few percent. Some say the highest one I got was 20%. So I would say less than 10% even now because it's a few years later. So this is the real challenge for ch top Chinese universities to become world class. And we need to re reform uh, the faculty evaluation and the reward system uh, to create a truly excellent research culture in these top universities. Uh, also, at the national level, uh, the real challenge is uh, the national research evaluation, evaluation system, evaluation uh, for many things anything related to research. Uh, these, this in, in evaluation system is driving the institutions and researchers to focus on quick indicators, such as grants, publications, awards, ranking positions, all of these quick indicators. Uh, no, this is not uh, only in China, it's anywhere in the, in the world, but for the Chinese university to, you know, to become really world-class university, we have to change this. There's no other choice. Uh, the challenges at the global level, uh, I would say, uh, maybe wrong, correct me. Um, uh, pressure is from the rapid rise of Chinese higher education, rise by quantity, uh, to some extent by quality, but as I said earlier, a long way to go. It's not. Uh, competitive uh, yet, I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, the suspicion is about the objectives of, of international initiatives, any of those from China, and the concerns uh, on Chinese uh, characteristics. Uh, I want to say a few words about the Chinese characteristics. Nobody knows what is, uh, what is the Chinese correct characteristics, no definition yet, no. Uh, but I would say, uh, 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 well, uh, let's, let me say, first of all, quite often, uh, uh, 
talked about, including is talked about this morning a few times, uh, on academic freedom. This is a uh, uh, for for ch Chinese universities institutions. They f they face a lot of offset pressure, including pressures from governments. Uh, and, but universities in other countries, in, including UK, also face a lot of diff uh, uh, pressures from the government and the other stakeholders. Maybe the, the pressure are different, but you always have this kind of pressure. Then how much freedom uh, you have to compromise from these pressures. Uh, for individual pre professors, uh, then that's another story. Uh, myself, as an example, I, in the uh, 25 years or 26 years of my uh, academic career, I never had any problem with academic freedom except one experience, which is related to the ranking. And the, the pressure or the in intervention is not from the Chinese government or university, my university, it's from the Western world. Uh, because of the ranking, uh, we, I got a lot of pressure, so-called diplomatic pressure, from developing countries, which I can understand, but also from developed countries. Uh, from rectors, pres presidents of world-class universities, uh, complaining formally or informally. Some uh, wrote formal letters to the Chinese government asking to stop this ranking. It's from world-class un university in the Western world. It's very formal. I was really shocked by this because I'm doing my research this ranking, my, the president, uh, the leadership of my university learned about the ranking from Germany. <coughs> when one of the vice presidents uh, visited Germany, I didn't even inform them I was doing the ranking and put it on the website. I had, and nobody uh, pressured me and until these uh, so-called diplomatic pressures. So uh, I was really shocked because you have academic freedom, but I cannot have. You ask the Chinese government to stop my academic research. Anyway, that's, except that, I never had any problem of academic freedom doing research or teaching in my academic career. Uh, uh, this is my final slide. Uh, Chinese universities are open. Uh, the president of the country uh, just said a couple of days ago uh, the country will be more and more open. The universities, uh, Chinese universities, will be more and more open, uh, eager to have more and deeper cooperation with the institutions of in the world uh, for a shared future. That's what he said. Uh, I, I believe that. And the Chinese university, universities are ready to contribute more and better opportunities, bonding, talents, for such international cooperation. And uh, my final remark is the Chinese characteristics are help rather than hindrance in such international cooperation. More importantly, these so-called Chinese characteristics are essential for the development of China. I don't know what is that. Uh, there's no definition again. And it's beneficial for the world. If you think about the characteristics, UK has its own characteristics. Each university in UK or in China has its own characteristics and values. We, I would think, yesterday I said, uh, Professor Madison uh, quoted actually uh, this morning at the opening, uh, we need to uh, listen to each other, understand each other, they respect each other, including re respect the differences, differences in the so-called characteristics. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.
very much. Uh, a brilliant overview, both of the uh, <coughs> progress and also some of the pressures uh, that now confront um, the Chinese HE system uh, as, it, as it continues to develop and expand. I've got quite a number of questions that I would like to ask you, but we don't have that much time because we have the next session at 2.15. Uh, and it would be great to invite as many comments, questions as we can fit into the time available. Who would like to start? We've got a couple of roving mics. I think we'll take two or three at least in a round and then come and ask Ian to, to respond. First one over there, second one there, third one there. So over there. of this size should have world-class universities. Uh, the, the question, uh, I'll say question anyway, she raised was, uh, you, uh, you have a lot of poverty. Your primary education sector is uh, not good enough. The in, in, in enrollment ratio is not higher than not percent. Why you put so much money in? Uh, world-class university. My answer is we need both. We need both. So uh, 
a country uh, with the size of China or India should have world-class universities. Both world-class universities, I mean not Harvard, but just world-class universities, and a world-class higher education system. We need a system. We not only need world-class university, but also world-class, let's say, vocational education. So all the diversified uh, uh, higher education system. Uh, but not all the countries should have world-class university, particularly the small. There's a lot of discussion in, uh, in the past uh, few years. Should the small countries have it? Should developing countries? Well, you have to think about or balance the national needs and the goal of have, having these world-class universities. But uh, huge countries like China should have both the world-class system and some world-class universities. Uh, the second question is about curiosity-driven research. Uh, actually, in the top universities, uh, top few universities in China, they are doing uh, many things to try to change this. Uh, for example, in my university, I said we are, in general, still indicator driven, uh, because, uh, but it's from quantity indicators to quality indicators. But that's not enough. What uh, we are doing in the universities for some uh, department of school, it's up to, uh, we have a, the, the schools, uh, the departments have a lot of autonomy. I wanted a lot of centralized control, but also a lot of autonomy. Uh, they can decide, they have this kind of, uh, uh, we, we, we don't talk about, we indicate this anymore. Some departments only for few selected professors. Professor Madison is a star professor. You don't have to uh, go through the, you know, the <coughs> annual evaluation with the indicators. So you can do whatever you want. Without this pressure, you know, they can do whatever they want for their curiosity. So this only happening in some schools, departments, for some professors, not all of them. For most of them, still, indicated driven. So there's a lot of changes and tries, but uh, you know, I like can feel the changes inside the university. Personally, myself, from the very beginning, I was doing research for my curiosity. That's, I, I always told, tell my colleagues that uh, why I can produce this ranking. It's controversial, it's a trouble for the world, but uh, it's something new because it's for curiosity. It's nobody, no, nobody tells me to do what. Uh, it's controversial in China, uh, in the world. Uh, the third question is about Chinese characteristics. Uh, it's not really Chinese characteristics because you mentioned about those special new forms uh, of, uh, let's say, internationalized higher education. I would say that way. Uh, I think China now, first of all, it's open already and it's more and more getting more and more open. And, uh, the Chinese higher education system is getting more and more diversified. You can go out and we would attract uh, international <coughs> universities to come into China. And we can have this all different. We just had an uh, in international venture at Cambridge or Oxford, from Oxford, from Peking University. So we go out, uh, we invite or attract uh, world-class university and any other institution to come is, uh, first of all, the government encouraged this kind of diversification. We need, you know, again, China is a, Chinese higher education is a, such a large system. We need all of these new ventures. Uh, the government is uh, quite often encouraging these new ventures by our policy initiatives and more often funding. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We are very nearly out of time. We've got time for two last very pithy questions. Uh, one there uh, and one over there. 
Yes. Thank you, Professor Lian, uh, for the very interesting uh, information about the performance of Chinese higher education and uh, children and uh, TV students in the University of Northampton. Uh, as you mentioned that the, um, uh, the, the higher education in China now has, uh, has been uh, challenged in the academic freedom of, um, in the academic of freedom. So, because I, I think that the reason is maybe the limitation of the political uh, context. And uh, so, what do you think that the uh, communist yeah, countries like uh, China and uh, Vietnam, so we can learn the lesson of uh, academic freedom from the um, Western developed countries yeah, for the um, for the communist countries. Thank you. Um, um, one final question was over was over there. Sorry, we're. <laughs> Nearly out of time. Gentlemen over there. Yeah. Thank you for that wonderfully honest presentation. I'm going to ask you a very hard question, but I will preface it by saying I'm personally enormously grateful to Shanghai Jiaotong University at Gordon Reading University of Hong Kong. In 1990, uh, Shanghai Jiaotong translated my book on Chinese capitalism, and I taught the first executive program at Jiaotong in 1981. So I'm personally very grateful to Jiaotong, which allows me the liberty of asking a hard question. <laughs> we know that China will find its own way. That is in all of the histories we look at. But how can it find its own way to the development of its own society without its higher education system researching Chinese society? Great. Good question to end on. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, uh, the first question about academic freedom. What I said is I didn't know any uh, problem of academic freedom in China, in my university. Let's say, and myself, but my only experience is from the Western world. The pressure from world class university in the Western world, not from my university or my government. So I don't think we have uh, any thing special about academic freedom. What I said is the universities also, like the university in the UK, in Europe, in the US, also face a lot of pressures from outside, including pressures from government funding uh, agencies. But nothing special about China. We don't have anything special uh, about it. So we don't have that uh, uh, problem at least, well, you, you can talk about many of the incidents about academic freedom, but uh, those are negligible, uh, to my mind, in terms of the, the goal and development of Chinese higher education, Chinese universities, and China uh, in general. Uh, the second question, I really don't know uh, <laughs> how to answer. It's a real hard question. Uh, uh, I would say this way, uh, China is open. Actually, Chinese, let's say Chinese hard cuisine, uh, we had the model of the former Soviet. Then, uh, starting from 40 years ago exactly, uh, China opened uh, and reformed since 1978. In the last 40 years, we learned, uh, we copied almost, I mean the top university, top research university, from the US model. 
we are fundamentally similar to U.S. universities. Now, uh, personally, and it is also in discussion in Chinese academic community, we should uh, learn more from European universities and collaborate more with European universities. And uh, 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 the good news is uh, uh, President Trump tried to help this. <laughs> yes. Anyway, there's a lot of problems in the Chinese higher education and Chinese universities. The good thing is the Chinese government and the institutions, universities, are trying extremely hard to solve these problems. Whatever the problem is, we are trying very hard. Uh, but the professors had uh, so much pressure, we complain all the time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again for such a, a, an open, insightful, and, and honest uh, assessment of, of the state of, of Chinese HG. I'm very sorry we had to bring the session to a close when I know there are many questions still out there, but I, I hope Nian will still be with us for the rest of the day if people want to talk informally to him.